Is this the third lockdown to end all lockdowns or is it the fourth? How many layers of masks do I need to wear to buy groceries today? And why is it safe to buy a cup of coffee at Costco but not at the coffee shop? We no longer live in a liberal democracy grounded in evidence-based policy making, logic and human rights. We've fallen down some kind of rabbit hole into a hellish nonsensical wonderland where the Mad Hatter, the March Hare and the Queen of Hearts are making the rules. We can argue about how this nightmare started and who nudged the ball to get the panic rolling. But the more important question at this stage of the game is, who's in charge now, today? Who has the authority to make this nightmare stop? To answer those questions, I'm going to take you on a little tour down the rabbit hole to show you the tangled web of rule makers, power brokers and influencers that are propping up this never ending hellscape. As the layers peel away, the more bizarre the story gets. And the answers that emerge are going to make your head spin because nothing in this wonderland is quite as it seems. To tell this tale, I'm going to jump straight into the middle since the beginning is unclear and there doesn't appear to be an end. The World Health Organization, the World Economic Forum and other intergovernmental agencies have their own agenda and they can all spew unscientific nonsense and make endless utopian policy recommendations, but they can't impose anything. All they can do is offer advice that no one is forced to follow. It would therefore be reasonable to assume that the rules being imposed on us and the power to make all this stop ultimately lies in the hands of each country's leader, if only it were that simple. Let's take Canada as the tortured example of this sordid tale, although any country would serve equally well because the story rhymes no matter which country is put under the looking glass. Politics is all about maintaining the illusion of competence. The important thing is to be seen doing something, no matter how ineffective, so that when the sun rises in the east tomorrow, the politicians can take credit for it. So not long after the virus first made its appearance, the government passed the Emergency Response Act, which gave the federal government the authority to fire up the printing presses, shut our national borders, and put our great-great-grandchildren into debt. And Prime Minister Trudeau has used these tools to put on a masterful performance to create the illusion of pulling out all the stops to save the world. Even a fool does what he can to avoid the appearance of impotence. But healthcare is a uniquely provincial responsibility. Aside from border restrictions and spending boatloads of money, there really isn't a single public health measure that the federal government can legally impose. When it actually comes to the public health measures, the Emergency Response Act merely lifts certain restraints that give the provinces the right to start making their own emergency rules. A rule to start making rules. The only authority Trudeau and the federal government have over provincial public health is the right, and indeed the responsibility, to intervene if provincial health measures violate our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. A responsibility he has categorically neglected so far for reasons that will soon become clear. But beyond that, he has no authority whatsoever to impose health policies onto provinces. Are you with me so far? Not to worry, the rabbit hole gets much, much deeper and the fun is just beginning. Trudeau does, however, have the responsibility to offer medical advice to help provinces coordinate their efforts. For that, he relies on his chief public health officer. Dr. Tam advises Trudeau, but he doesn't have to follow her advice, although going against her recommendations would be politically risky. But since he's her paymaster and can fire her at will, her advice is likely tailored to what she thinks he wants to hear. This creates a bizarre catch-22 where it becomes impossible to identify where bad ideas originate. They may actually be winding each other up, each afraid of contradicting the other out of fear for their own jobs. Her supposedly apolitical advice requires political approval so she can keep her job. His recommendations to the provinces better not contradict the medical experts so that frightened voters don't lose their confidence in his leadership ahead of the next election. But since health is not a federal jurisdiction, the provinces don't actually need to follow the recommendations of either of these Muppets. They can pick and choose what they want to hear. The buck stops with the premiers for what happens in each province. So we finally found the culprits who are holding us hostage, right? Not so fast. Each premier likewise has a chief public health officer to advise them. But premiers are not bound by their recommendations either. Policy is, after all, supposed to be a political decision with the option, but not the obligation, to balance advice from multiple departments, health, economy, human rights, etc., which are often in conflict with one another. 
But Ontario Premier Doug Ford recently openly admitted on camera that, I'm going to be frank, there's no politician in this country that's going to disagree with their chief medical officer. They just aren't going to do it. They might as well throw a rope around their neck and jump off a bridge. They're done. Meanwhile, remember the accidental hot mic confession by Dr. Yaffe, Ontario's associate chief medical officer, speaking to Dr. Williams, Ontario's chief medical officer. I don't know why I bring all these papers. I never look at them. I just say whatever they write down for me. Which means no one's really in charge because the premiers are avoiding accountability by hiding behind their health officials, while the health officials avoid accountability by advising whatever they think their political bosses want to hear. What a lovely self-reinforcing cycle of fascist terror imposed through sheer cowardice. Everyone, from top to bottom, appears to be trying to weasel their way out of blameworthiness, and so a system of suffocating tyranny is growing, not because of the strong hand of a dictatorial mastermind, but because of a bunch of gutless invertebrates who are trying to hide behind each other's coattails. Individual cities, with their mayors and their own chief medical officers, are repeating this madness by implementing their own rules independently from the provinces. You would think that the provinces wouldn't tolerate this kind of jumbled patchwork of DIY rulemaking on their turf, but you'd be wrong. Although some premiers have exercised their right to overrule some cities that tried to be more lax than the provincial rules called for, so far no premier has dared roll back municipal rules that are more draconian than the provincial rules out of fear of yet again being accused of putting lives at risk. He who has the most alarmist rules gets to be in charge and hopes to take credit for saving the universe when the virus eventually fades away on its own. There's a strong correlation between media praise and future career prospects, whereas in the current climate of cancel culture, failure to match policy to media hysteria could easily prove fatal to any promising career. Now that it's been normalized to ignore inalienable rights and freedoms in exchange for the promise of safety, rights that previously would have put limits on the kinds of policies that these invertebrates can dream up, there's really no downside to alarmism for any of these people, but a great deal of risk if they grow a spine. Ah, yes. And then there's the media, the poison cup that just keeps on giving. They are smack dab in the middle of all of this, driving the hysteria to create clickbait to keep eyeballs glued to screens, which motivates them to constantly push health officials and politicians to new heights of hysteria and pounce on any that dare try to dial down the rhetoric. They have a business to run. It's clear that they've convinced themselves that investigative journalism doesn't pay the bills or secure lucrative government subsidies. But fear sells, handsomely. If it bleeds, it leads. Turn up the fear dial to harvest the low-hanging fruit and keep those advertising profits coming in. The politicians have no choice now but to dance to their tune. Could any of these various players pull the brakes on this madness today? Unlikely unless they all acted in unison to re-embrace integrity, evidence, honest debate, and human rights. Speaking out on their own would likely cost any lone dissenter their job and see them swiftly replaced by someone else willing to play the game. Every politician, official, and journalist understands this game perfectly well. Council culture is very, very real. To flinch, to admit error, or to show restraint when the mob craves action are surefire ways to find yourself at the losing end of a council culture coup. All anyone needs to do to put their career in jeopardy is say something reasonable. The cry of alarm will instantly sound and the furies will begin to circle like sharks that smell blood in the water. Apologize, resign, repent. How can you be so reckless? Look at all those other countries. They can't all be wrong. A cult demands purity of thought. Nothing helps cure independent thinking quite like the threat of a purge. And there are plenty of disciples eager to create some space in the hierarchy for promotion. So in this game, conformity is the key to survival. So like twiddly dumb and twiddly dee, none dares contradict one another. That conformity even extends across borders. No one dares to be the black sheep of the global community, not after the drubbing dished out by the media against Sweden and South Dakota, now joined by Florida and more recently Texas, for the audacity of following long-established pandemic planning guidelines. Unless politicians feel that their voters are overwhelmingly behind them, they're not going to stick their necks out. All it takes is a single voice to trigger the next wave of alarm, and like a flock of birds, they all take flight out of fear of contradicting the alarmist, out of fear of being left behind. That's why they refuse to discuss scientific evidence and epidemiological data. It risks splitting them off from the flock. So it's no longer just the compliant public that appears to be suffering from Stockholm Syndrome. 
It's also becoming a survival mechanism for many of the politicians, health officials, and journalists in order to come to terms with the situation that they find themselves in. It's better to surrender your mind to a popular delusion than to stand alone in defense of an unpopular truth. Graveyards are full of people who were in the right. Anyone breaking ranks to discuss actual verifiable evidence is willingly demoting themselves to the ranks of the conspiracy theorists, the catch-all phrase that politicians and media have used to smear anyone and everyone who disagrees with their narrative. It's a desperate ploy used by desperate people to protect the coherence of their self-deception. By now they've all strayed so far from evidence-based policy making that if rationality returns and the public and the courts examine the data with their own eyes, it will undeniably cost them all their jobs and guarantee them a date with a human rights tribunal. Better to pretend the evidence doesn't exist. Better to pretend the science is settled. Better to distract the public with unintelligible scientific jabberwocky. And better to pretend that the truth hinges on credentials and the opinions of elites. So they put on their best poker faces, close ranks, and defend their house of cards because it's the only shelter they've got. And that brings up another influential player in this deadly little game, which is making politicians dance like puppets on a string, the frightened mob itself. Politicians, bureaucrats, media, and businesses are all slaves to public opinion, weather vanes. Swimming against the strong tide is lethal. Going against the will of the mob is a dangerous sport. Not even the courts dare push against it if the current is strong enough. So it's no longer just shameless opportunists whipping the crowd to ever greater heights of fear. Once the crowd's imagination was stirred by the menace of an invisible virus, the crowd itself often does its own whipping. Consider how often politicians have tried to reopen schools, fully supported by epidemiological data and peer-reviewed scientific research, only to back down and issue a groveling apology after parents and teachers howled in protest. And consider that even the WHO, which did much of the whipping during the early days of the pandemic, is now routinely ignored as it has tried to back away from some of the most extreme measures and has tried to urge for a measure of restraint. Those that initially whipped the crowd into hysteria are now held hostage by that very same hysterical crowd. Woe to anyone that tries to make the music stop. Any opportunist who wants to inject their agenda into this deadly game simply needs to keep the music playing with a few well-timed injections of fear, and the politicians, public servants, and media are forced to dance to their tune like puppets on a string. The authorities are now trapped in a trap of their own making. It's quite a lovely setup, really, for anyone who would like to push an agenda. The opportunists get to choose the tune, and the politicians take the fall if it goes wrong. Who wouldn't jump on a deal like that? It's an all-you-can-eat smorgasbord of opportunities for anyone willing to check their conscience at the door. Suddenly, all those intergovernmental agencies like the WHO and the World Economic Forum, which I dismissed at the beginning of this tale as being mere advisors without access to the levers of power, don't look quite so powerless after all, do they? Nor are they alone. Any number of players, big and small, can tap into this mad, ready-made, nonsensical, fear-based policy-making machine to nudge the system in their favor. From Big Pharma, the Chinese Communist Party, and Agenda 2030, to the pettiest of politicians and the most unscrupulous of public servants, activists, socialists, businessmen, scientists, and policy advisors, there are opportunities waiting to be harvested for all of them. It doesn't mean they're all taking advantage, nor that they're all working together or even have the same agenda. And not every conspiracy theory will turn out to be true. But it most certainly means that some are doing it. It's a game just begging to be played. I've taken the time to draw up a handy cheat sheet to help us all keep track of all the various players who have influence in this unpleasant game. It looks something like this. When the virus eventually fades, the politicians, public servants, and media at the center of the hysteria would still get off scot-free if they can somehow take credit for bringing the crisis to an end. Lockdowns, vaccines, and vaccine passports are their get-out-of-jail-free card, but only as long as everyone believes the illusion. Their get-out-of-jail-free card evaporates if enough people wake up to the scam. A crowd is ruthless and unforgiving. It will not be kind if it realizes it has been fooled, or if it recognizes that the horrors imposed on unsuspecting citizens were dead wrong. And that brings up the last of the players in this nightmarish wonderland. Because don't think that we, the critics, the dissenters, the much-maligned, tinfoil-hat-wearing advocates for debate, evidence, and human rights, don't also play a role. We're not mere spectators on the sidelines. We too play a dangerous role in this mad game of chess. 
by refusing to be fooled by looking at, documenting, and pointing at the evidence, and through our relentless demands for accountability, we risk waking up the credulous crowd and turning it into a mob baying for vengeance. And that, in turn, forces everyone whose fingerprints are on this nightmare to lash out in self-defense. We're blocking the door that gives the architects and opportunists of this nightmare a safe retreat. Through our mere existence, or even the mere possibility of our existence, they can no longer be 100% certain that they won't face accountability for what was done on their watch. We're a reminder that the illusion is not absolute. We're the wind to their house of cards. We're a reminder of what's waiting for them if the music stops. So the more mistakes they make, and the more collateral damage that adds up, the more they have to double down on defending their illusion to protect their own necks. And so the unconscious realization begins to creep in. They must maintain control, forever, for their own protection. Critics must be discredited and silenced for all time. The illusion must become permanent and universally accepted. That's why we see headlines in mainstream media appear, like we must start planning for a permanent pandemic. They have no choice now. They're now held hostage by their fear of accountability and we're held hostage to the choices they must make. It has become a zero-sum game. The battle for the hearts and minds of the crowd has only just begun. In short, it's the perfect self-feeding storm. We're all trapped in a lethal game of croquet with the ungovernable queen of hearts, and no one is certain whose head she'll point at next to satisfy her next bout of blind fury. Everyone, but also no one, is in charge. Everyone takes their cues from everyone else and no one can deviate from their current course. So perhaps the real question that needs to be asked at this stage of the game is not who's in charge. It might be better to ask, is anyone in charge at all? And if the answer to that question is no, then the dominoes that have been set in motion may be the worst disaster of all, because then the only restraint to how far the pendulum can swing towards insanity, oppression, and persecution is how far the crowd is willing to go along for the ride before they stand up en masse by the millions to flood the streets and tell the government enough. It's the only path left that leads back to freedom, and it really is that simple. I hope people cherish their freedom enough to take it back while they still can. So the cat was right, we're all mad or we wouldn't be here, and at this point he's probably the only one still capable of grinning. If this tour down the rabbit hole has inspired you to dust off your copy of Lewis Carroll's 1865 classic, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, or its 1871 sequel, Through the Looking Glass, I highly recommend the biting social satire and labyrinth of logic games found in the original texts over the heavily modified, sanitized, and cutesy Hollywood adaptations. You can't improve on a classic. I've put links to Lewis Carroll's originals in the description below. Thanks for watching, and please hit the like button and subscribe to my channel for future videos.